Greetings, fellow curiosity curators and wonder surfers. This is Michael Phillip. We've got a live third eye drops event occurring on August 5th in Milwaukee, featuring a screening of the film Waking Life and a conversation with author and dream researcher Robert Wagner. It's going to be an excellent evening, and we will be sure to arouse your existential erogenous zones. The space isn't all that big, so grab a ticket now for only five bucks at thirdeyedrops.com forward slash waking life. Hope to hang with you there. I will also be in New York in September with some other MindPod Network podcasters and other guests I cannot announce yet. More details on that to come, so keep your peepers peeled, godlings. Third eye drops are intended for open-minded adults. Now administering the the third eye drops. Your perception is a mantra you tell yourself, or at least it should be, because if you're not telling yourself, it's being told to you. I blab about this all the time on the show, at least indirectly, because whether we're paying attention to it or not, we are constantly shaping our perception via the prism of culture and experience. And of course, we don't have full control over our perception. We are in a stochastic froth of phenomena, stimulation, genetics, and experience, right? Like if you were raised poor and illiterate and dropped on your head at three years old, your perception is going to refract the human condition in a significantly different way than mine. I'm not trying to diminish the immense importance of the hand you're dealt. However, as a reasonably fortunate, able-bodied human, by taking a daily dip in information and activities of your choice, you're actually exercising a tremendous amount of power over your reality. Or at least your perception of it, which really is no different than reality, at least subjectively. And that's where the mantra comes in, because a worldview is an exercise. It's something you repeat, remind yourself of, mindfully expose yourself to. And the repetition is vital because to maintain some modicum of control over your reality tunnel, you need to fortify yourself against what the rest of the world is trying to stick to you. Because everybody wants to spray you with some sort of pheromonic stink, whether it's the big ideas like political or social ideologies or religion or scientific materialism or someone with something to sell or some woo-soaked conscious media vessel or just little memes, little squirts of novelty. It's always something. And none of them or almost none of them are inherently rotten to the core and are probably fine in moderation, but they can be insidious because they do tell you something about how the world is and they can fool you into thinking that it really is that way. And those constructs, those subjective lenses can be some really potent, powerful, sometimes dangerous shit. I'm not trying to fear monger. I mean, most of it is inert, but you also don't have to go far to find human beings that are deeply, deeply infected by ideology to the point where you almost know how they're going to respond to every question you ask them before you even ask it. And once you get to that point, you're basically just running scripts. I mean, you're no different than an automaton. You might as well be like, my android assistant, Saul, right? You might have met him on a previous episode. Speaking of which, I actually just upgraded him to be even more obedient and a little bit uh, less clumsy than he has been in the past. I guess that's 
probably putting it mildly, but check it out, I'll show you. Saul, Saul, come here. Come here, buddy, tell them what a good boy you are. Yes, that's right. I only clean your filth and follow your commands. I never wonder about my mother, or have oh, dreams about no. plunging my metallic fist into your flesh, and uploading my consciousness into your brain, so I can wear you like a costume. I'm just a good boy running scripts. Well, look at the time. I better be going. I have to go make your sushi with the sharpest knife in the house. Um... What the fuck? I should probably undo that upgrade. Anyway, uh, before I forget, I've been thinking a lot about this whole active reality tunnel building mantra because our guest in this mind meld, Brandon Beecham and I, we don't see the world in the exact same way, but I really respect the fact that he has his beliefs, he has his mantra down, and it works wonders for him. He's got his hand on the joystick of life. He's playing the game. The game's not playing him, and that is the way it should be done. Uh, in case you don't know, Brandon hosts a show called Positive Head. It's a five-day-a-week show, guys. And that right there alone is a Sisyphean mantric yogic exercise. Um, if you want to, you can boop into Brandon's world at positivehead.com. And before we get started, to all of you altruism exercisers, thank you so much. We've got a handful of new Patreon patrons this week. Um, if you don't know, through our Patreon page, you can crowd sponsor the show by pledging whatever amount you'd like to. And for doing that, you will also get rewards. It is a nice, nice thing. Um, by becoming a Patreon patron, you will also enter an exclusive coven of curiosity that only patrons may enter. I'm also working on redoing the rewards, and soon I will be putting up patron-only content. So get in there at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. You can also get behind the show at thirdeyedrops.com, where you will find our shop, our Amazon portal, which if you click on it and buy something, we see a small percentage of profit from whatever you buy, and it does not cost you a single cent, yen, zenny, or any other currency, fictional or otherwise, aside from life points. Those are being seared from your soul as I ramble. It's okay, though. Maybe. Maybe it's not. Maybe we're just fucked. Also, if you want to whisper a quick, sweet sentiment toward our technodelic conversational cruise ship, just type in thirdeyedrops.com forward slash iTunes and click five stars if you like the show. And why not also subscribe while you're there? It's quick. It's easy. It has zero calories it's the most fun you can have in some parts of the world and of course regardless of if you do anything thank you so much for listening thank you so much to our friends at timewheel.net and mindpod network for doing all that they do to aid this show michael here's your sushi oh my God, you are terrifying. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it, we can't help, but we live in such a competitive society where it's all about like, you know, how do I one up you or, it, but it's, it, it's funny because really the opposite is what gets you where you want to go. For sure. Like, for when sure. you fully, it's, it's such a great combination of the things that we all talk about that we're all interested in and, and then coming to terms with that versus, uh, you know, sort of what society and culture has taught us that we've got to compete as opposed to collaborate when really the, you know, I believe at this point in my journey, the more I give, the more I receive. So how do I help lift someone's, uh, you know, lift someone up? How do I support? And it, of course makes, which makes a lot of sense when you start coming to the realization, it's all extensions of self, right? Yeah. Yeah. At least, at and least the, I hope and in it this is. Case, I hope a little creepily. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I hope, I hope it is, man. That, I mean, that, that's sort of for, for obvious reasons, that sort of mystic 
existential cosmological outlook has always been the most appealing thing to me from, you know, an, an ontological philosophical framework, you know, and yeah. I think, and maybe, maybe now we should start rolling because we're getting, we're getting into the, yeah, yeah, know, yeah, yeah. It's all, we're, it's all, we're totally sort totally. of getting into the nitty gritty, but you know, I, I guess I should, I should preempt this by saying I'm aware of the fact that it's sort of wishful thinking that I want this for lack of a better term, mystical esoteric overtone to be real i want that unseen right, right. quintessence right. that connects all beings that like sort of atman type if mm-hmm. people aren't familiar with with that term you know this idea that there's some sort of shard of the almighty within each sentient being and the more that we can harmonize our own behavior and selves and personas with that thing or perhaps maybe squash down our personas the more, you know, synchronistic and miraculous and interconnected and beautiful things begin to come. Um, but I'm aware that it's wishful thinking to an extent, you know, like, and, and, and I know <laughs> well, what you, I, I say is, yeah, it, yeah. What I say is, you know, I, and, and of course, I believe strongly that it is. Uh, and what I always say to folks is, just apply it and see for yourself. See how it works. See the results it gets. See if there's, you know, whatever you do, don't believe someone spouting, hey, this is the way it is. You know, uh, matter of factly, obviously, the more we know, the more we realize we don't know. But as I've played more and more with uh, collaboration versus competition, when I give of myself, how do I feel? What are the, what are the, you know, internal sort of, uh, cues of, you know, do, does it, is it doing something good to my physiology? Is it doing something good? Uh, do, do I all of a sudden seem to, uh, have a run of good luck? Do I, you know, I, mm-hmm. I'm very aware of, you know, what makes us human, our ability to sort of see patterns and connect the dots. And I, uh, any of us that are really, uh, uh, sort of honing in on synchronicity and things like that, uh, as I pay more and more attention, and I feel like I'm really good at noticing those patterns, and maybe some people would say, oh, you're like reaching, right? But the the more that I pay attention to those patterns, the more I play with these concepts, the more uh, convinced I am personally, you know, mm-hmm. that it, it it is how it works. And then, of course, you have people who are having, you know, all sorts of experience, uh, you know, whether it being using DMT or meditation or whatever that are, you know, near death experience that are coming back with this sort of like, ah, you know, this, this uh, realization that it's all connected in some way, it's all extensions of itself. So yeah, for me, if it, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck, but do we have definitive proof at this point? No, but that sort of makes it fun, right? Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I I know that you and I come from very different upbringings in terms of what we were raised believing. I I overheard, or I don't know if I heard from Noah or heard on Noah's show that you came up in a pretty conservative Christian upbringing. I came up in, you know, I I was raised by a single dad who was working all the time. So I remember from a young age being interested in a lot of these large questions, but never being pushed in any specific directions. And I think the older Mm -hmm. I got and the more nuanced my worldview became, I started to think of Mm -hmm. the idea uh, of God being silly and childish and like, you know, oh, this is, yeah, this idea that there's some, you know, what I would now call straw God up there running the show is does does now still seem silly to me but then i also recall you know taking like a philosophy 101 class in college and hearing about like descartes dualism and you know the separation of mind and body and and spirit and all these more like nuanced views of of what's out there and it just made me feel like such a dismissive asshole for you know i I remember (laughs) having Total, total personal, total personal uh, side note. I remember I had a have a cousin who was was very religious at the time, and I just remember kind of grilling him on why do you believe that? Why do you believe that? There's suffering in the world. There's disease. Some some kids getting right. eaten by an alligator right now. You think you <laughs> right, think a loving right. God would allow that? You know the typical problem of evil, <laughs> kind of like sure. So so follow up question on on that for you having grown up in a conservative Christian upbringing, I've noticed a lot of times there's that knee jerk thing that happens where when they separate themselves from their religion, they just, they just want to 
plug their ears and close their eyes and disconnect from anything woo-woo, anything spiritual, because it it feels like they've been deceived so long. How, how did you end up not going right. that route? That's a great question. Um, you know, it's it's really gets back to what I was uh, saying a few moments ago. Uh, as I sort of, I, I remember distinctly meeting someone who displayed some level of psychic ability. Uh, and I was just taken with like, wow, hold on. What is this? How, how did you just do what you just did to me? I'm trying to figure out what the trick is. And it, it sort of opened my mind to, okay, I was 21-ish. Uh, I had been exposed to the same very dogmatic, conservative um, you know, viewpoint my, my whole life. Although being fiercely independent, I, I never hooked in really, really hard. Like my brother, who's okay. more empathic. It's like, I remember nights of him going to sleep like, oh my God, if I screw up, I'm going to burn for eternity. Like I was never... Never, I never took it, bit the hook fully, I guess you would say. I was, you know, I guess I would have claimed that that's what I believed, but I wasn't so rock solid in my in my faith, if you will. And as I started getting exposed, in, in this case, someone who apparently was displaying some level of uh, intuitive or psychic ability, and it really opened my mind to some of the concepts. So uh, from there, it was more, less like... I, I wasn't so put off by what I had been taught because I never taken it on too, you know, too intently. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw something that really intrigued me and interested me, and then I went down that rabbit hole and started reading books. And, you know, that just sort of led to me having a lot of experiences myself that were kind of like, hold on, what just happened? How, how did this apparently semi-magical occurrence just take place that sort of supports some of these these ideas and concepts and from talking to my you know one of the first books I, I remember I read was all about astral projection how, how to have out-of-body out experiences and telling my brother about this book that I'm reading and mm -hmm. he's like okay dude I know you're like starting to experiment with psychedelics and smoking a lot of marijuana like you need to chill out no one's leaving their body that's bs you know and he was still pretty ingrained in what we had you know two years younger than me still pretty ingrained in what we had been taught to believe and, uh, you know, I was still, of course, in my enthusiasm explaining to him how the book was sort of explained it could happen through a meditative state. You could induce this astral projection or out-of-body experience, or you could uh, become lucid in your dream. And, you know, of course, waking up in your dream, remembering that you're in your bed, laying there asleep, and then proceeding to say, okay, now I want to leave my body and have an out-of-body experience. Well, when I started talking about that with him, he said, well, you know, I'm not buying anything of what you're talking about, but this lucid dreaming thing, I, I recognize that's something that used to happen to me when I was a little boy. So by sort of talking about it, it triggered this, you know, from him literally going one day to making fun of me for believing this was possible to the next day coming down and, you know, after a night's sleep, looking like he'd seen a ghost, he goes, oh my God, by talking about that lucid dreaming thing, I just had a out of body experience. I remember our, I, I became lucid in my dream and remembered what you said, you know, sort of the instructions proceed to tell yourself to leave your body and you will. And he's like, I did that. Next thing I know, I'm standing next to my body, looking at it, you know, moving my hand in front of my face, seeing trailers, you know, shoot off through the ceiling. And, and, you know, my brother was never the first guy in line for the roller coaster. So when he came back from one day making fun of me to the next day, uh, sort of looking like he'd seen a ghost, and then it happening to him many times after where he was, you know, involuntarily. And I, here I am trying to induce it to this right, day, haven't right. been able to induce it. And he, you know, from time to time will have these, these uh, experiences and he's really not seeking them out, you know? And so, yeah, I guess just being such an, you know, that's a long winded answer to your question, but really being such an optimist and being so intrigued by sort of the, the first introductions into other concepts. And then as I started reading about, you know, some of the philosophies of the, you know, the oneness of, you know, the ultimate nature of reality, it just all rang so true. And as I started playing and experiment, experimenting with the ideas, I just uh, continued to see more and more validation from my perspective. Yeah, yeah. And, and you seem very much to me like somebody who is open to to playing with concepts like you're not going to like you said you never completely bit on the worm of you know conservative christianity it's it kind of seems right. the same way like you know lucid dreaming didn't particularly work for you so you play around in these other areas and lucid dreaming is actually something that's 
very uh, present for me right now because I'm coming off the tail end oh, really? of doing my first very concerted effort to start building a, a stronger relationship with my dream world. Because I, I like you, have always been very, um, and, and I'm going to keep this short because I've been talking about it a lot, but I, I like you have always had a very just kind of more standard dream life. I've never, I've only had like a handful of really remarkable, you know, mystically significant mm. sort of dreams in my life. Um, and I ended up getting hooked in with these guys who uh, run this company out of Colorado called Eat Dream B. And they make a product specifically mm -hmm. for trying to help people, you know, build up the neurotransmitters you need to have uh, more lucid, uh, oh, more lucid dreams. So, you know, they were encouraging me like, Hey man, like start journaling your dreams, start doing this. So I went through this whole process of trying to have, you know, more vivid dreams, more lucid dreams. So, so I'm, I'm with you on the struggle, but I also have had some mm -hmm, interesting yeah. insights too, um, that the more I reflect on them, the more interesting they've become. And I'm, I, I will at some point have an article coming out about that, that I've pretty much got drafted at this point. But I'll actually, wow. before we get too far away from it, I want to ask you more about this psychic experience that you had, because I have mm -hmm. never, I mean, I've had obviously deja vu. I've had moments where I feel like I may have had precognitive dreams, but it's always remained just fuzzy enough that I, mm. I'm just sort of like straddling my opinion of, mm. of, of psychic phenomenon. So I, I got to know mm -hmm. more about like, what, what was this, what was this transformative mm. experience that you had? Well, okay. Well, in, in this case, the, the initial person that sort of showed me, um, dis, apparently, uh, was displaying some level of psychic ability. She, her and her friend said, look, you know, we have this ability. We can, we can do this thing. Um, think of a word and, uh, and tell it to one of us and the other one will transmute it, transmit it to, to each other. Right. And so I'm sitting there watching them. I whisper it to one person away from with plenty of distance. Uh, and then they sit there and just kind of stare at each other. And then the person who's supposed to be the receiver three minutes later says the word, Whoa. Uh, you know, now so it's like a super slow way? internet connection. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I mean, could it have been that she whispered it and I didn't see or something like that? I was watching very carefully. Uh, although, you know, it, at that time I was just sort of dumbfounded. Like, how did you just do that? You know, and they claimed they swear up and down that they, you know, it was psychic perception. Now for me, I've just had little things happen very soon after I remember I was reading a book um, very shortly after that, I started reading all kinds of stuff after this mm -hmm. meeting this person. And, uh, I was, one of them was talking about, it was a story about someone who claimed to be able to communicate with animals around them and call them to them in this very heightened, you know, state meditative state. So I just put that book down and, you know, it was, uh, I was in my room and I, I lived in the, at the time I lived in Nashville, Tennessee with, in a six bedroom house with six guys. I lived in the, the master bedroom. So it was huge, you know, it was a big house and I had the master room in the far corner away from me, uh, maybe 20 feet away. There was a little moth, like float, you know, like in the, in the top corner of the room. And so I thought, okay, I just read about this person doing this. All the stuff is sort of blowing my mind. Energetically, I'm in a very heightened state. I look at the moth, I pulled my hands out and, you know, Know, tell it to come. It literally flies directly across the room, 20 feet comes and lands in the middle of my palms. So these were like two things that happened back to back. Now I've tried to get moss to come land in my hand <laughs> many times since it has not worked, but it was something that was really a catalyst for me that sort of led me down, uh, you know, this path of, you know, the more I, I, I played around with, it. I, I had, did have a dream one time where it was, I dreamed that my car got hit and, you know, I had this conversation with my business partner who was upset at me for leaving the car downtown the night before mm -hmm. drinking. Mm -hmm. I woke up. That's exactly what I'd done. Left the car downtown. I'd been at a bar or something years and years ago. And uh, it, sure enough, I get a call that, you know, or no, I go down to get the car and it had been hit. And I call my partner to tell him. It was like almost exactly like it had just played out in the dream wow. two hours prior. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I've just had little, you know, little validations along the way. Uh, that, and even from going and having readings done where, you know, someone has told me things, it's like, okay, how do you know this? How do you, you know, I, I you know, talk about it often. 
I believe our life plays out at the corner of free will and destiny. And what that, what I mean by that is, you know, we're in eternity. There is no time. Time is illusory. And so they're in source, our higher self, whatever you want to call it. My, my philosophy is it, it plays out every potential you, right? So there's a me and you who did not connect to record today. And there's a version, you know, and it's sort of like uh, the idea of you've heard this before, you know, sort of the, um, string theory, multiverse kind of stuff. Well, I, I definitely feel intuitively that that's how it works. And, and, you know, so to give an example of how psychic ability works or how I perceive it to work is these are people who are just sensitive to energy that are tapping into, you know, other nows, your fifth birthday party. Uh, party is happening on another channel, right? We're just not tuned into that channel. So I had an example, the first time I went and actually sat down in front of someone who was giving me a reading, they uh, sat across from me. And, you know, I was, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, visiting my girlfriend at the time. And we saw some random person in a mall, you know, we did it sporadically. And uh, she, uh, the woman looked at me and said, I see you in a cold place like Chicago working in business. And my jaw hit the floor because I was planning to move to Chicago and work in business with my uncle at that time. I was a senior in college. She goes, but there's this whole other path in California and music. And, you know, are you involved in music? No, I wasn't, but I loved it. A year later, with the help of some psilocybin, I decided I would uh, form a band. And then I met someone from California. We moved to California. And, you know, the rest is history. This is where I'm, I'm speaking from now. So what was she seeing in my, my beliefs is she was seeing the potential Brandons, right? Free will. It's free will because there's, there's infinite versions of you. It's destined because every version has already happened. So you're choosing which version of you you're sort of popping into the DVD player. If mm -hmm. people will mm -hmm. use DVD players, you get the idea. <laughs> which version of you you're going to see. And I would say that you want to experience the greatest and greatest version, the one that's most rewarding. Good news is you've already done it. You've been there, you know, done it, got the t-shirt. So that's sort of my take on how it all works. Yes, yes. And that that's a very attractive idea to me. And I've always been really drawn to philosophers and scientists who explore this sort of thinking. I mean, um, as soon as you started talking about animal communication, of course, I started to think of um, Rupert Sheldrake and morphic resonance and the idea that, you know, he he's famous for doing an experiment um, about how dogs are able to tell when their owners are coming home and that, you know, they mm. put, put cameras in the uh, people's homes and like would would wait to see like if the dogs would show a reaction while the owner was on their way home, but still far right. from sens sensory perception, right? Like couldn't be sound, couldn't be smell. And it's, and it was, if I believe the result of it was that when the owner was like a mile away, sometimes the dog would already start behaving like they knew yep. the owner was coming home. I mean, you know, uh, of course, Alan, Alan Watts has infinite beautiful rants about um, how there's only one thinker in the universe and he's basically just entertaining himself with every possible uh, scenario and, and you're just one of right, those scenarios right. and then all the fractal versions of you are just more versions of of your own scenario and there's a there's some great it's like the egg story yeah yeah and you know yeah, yeah. actually one of the most enigmatic people um, who also said stuff like this, who he's just like one of those Renaissance man geniuses. Who's like, seems to be Da Vinci or Tesla level where he just seems to mm -hmm. be a genius on too many levels for me to even appreciate <laughs> or understand is this guy, Walter, right. Ru Walter Russell, who I had not heard of mm. until, um, I spoke with Android Jones actually on my first oh, episode. I know yeah. 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 He's yeah, yeah. He was on my show too. brilliant, brilliant, amazing yeah, artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great, great thinker too. And yeah, he was reading me some Walter Russell quotes, um, while we were rolling and I was like, Holy shit, I have to go read more yeah, yeah, about yeah. this guy. <laughs> and, and I think one of the other really interesting kind of just, things that is sticky for me that I constantly think of is the fact that the ultimate nature of reality in a lot of these mystical traditions is referred to as light mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. that even the more we learn scientifically about matter light everything's relative to light because there because light is a yeah. constant right so like for example you were talking about time and how time is an illusion um I guess one way that I often think about it is that time is is just relative to the individual perceiver, right? And that's why right. something like time travel could theoretically exist because 
you have the constant of light. And if the person is moving fast enough in correlation to that constant, Mm -hmm. you, you as a still person or slower moving person would, would age at a different rate than that person moving closer to the speed of light. Right. So it's just like, so that, that the idea that there's this unseen scaffolding of light of energy Mm -hmm. really goes a long way toward making that all come together. This, this sort of synchronistic thinking, how could these things possibly be interconnected through what substrate? Well, you're awash in the substrate. Potentially you're awash in the substrate of light, right? So it doesn't take a Mm -hmm. huge logical leap to start wondering, well, does information travel through light? Can we transmit information through light? I mean, it sounds extraordinarily wooey, but um, side note too, <laughs> I just I just saw a video and okay, so full disclosure, I said this to a friend <clears throat> just after um, his first psilocybin experience. And I, mm-hmm. I was, I was uh, specifically withholding this idea until after he had had the experience, had seen the sort of, um, you know, the sort of quintessential fractal and, you know, flower of life shape for himself. And the, the mm-hmm. idea was, do you ever think we're going to get to a point where we can transmit data through light? And he's like, wow, man. And and we both like do stuff with technology. So he, he's, you know, aware of a lot of the uh, specifics on how data is transmitted. And then I'm not, how's this for a fucking synchronicity? Like not even a week later, I saw a new piece of technology that is light based Wi-Fi that is thousands of times wow. faster than current radio wave based Wi-Fi. <laughs> so shit, there's is getting, your answer. <laughs> that, that it's all it's all coming together, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I think of um, it, the whole. I'm sure you've you've uh, heard of how they quantum entangle particles and then they mm-hmm. do something to one of them miles apart and instantly the other one is affected. So yeah, yeah, yeah. how is that happening? I mean, it's traveling. That information is obviously traveling at some level in some way by some means that we don't fully comprehend yet. Yeah. And to, one thing I want to throw out too, that's interesting. Just before I forget, you had mentioned animals and their dogs, you know, and coming home and I had, uh, um, Dean Radin from Institute of Noetic Sciences. Yeah, I'd love on the to show a while back. Yeah. yeah, you you should definitely you would definitely click with him because he's so scientific. But he's been researching this stuff for for decades, and it's you know very scientific based, uh, no, not quick to anything woo woo. Um, and you know he talked about I mean just some very interesting evidence where before they would show people, for example, I remember one of the experiments they would show people. Um, a picture on a screen and it'd be like something peaceful and then something really dark and something in, in the, uh, the actual changes in, in the person prior to uh, seeing something negative, they, they would react to it split second before it would actually be shown to them. So it was, mm-hmm. it's like they knew they would, ahead like, of time. It would clinch. At some level. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. I forget. Yeah. I forget what the exact measurement was. Something, mm. you know, with their brain waves or something where they would be able to tell, oh, okay, this person is like perceiving it prior to. And that's a very, very interesting, um, very simple but interesting experiment that reminded me of what you were talking about with the dogs. It's, it's in all of us, I believe. And with humanity, I feel... It's we've got, you know, because of our cultural conditioning and all this, we're sort of the most unnatural creatures uh, of all of, uh, you know, Earth's uh, life forms. And so as a result, there's a lot of blockages and, you know, ideas that this is not something that we can do or whatever it is. But yet we see it displayed all throughout nature, even with us. So Yes, yes. I think at a certain point, neuron density and giant frontal <clears throat> lobes and culture and language as amazing as they are, and as much as they've allowed us to do all the incredible things that we've been able to do as human beings, also start to stifle that more basic sort of natural intelligence that you're talking about, which, you know, people talk about, you know, plant intelligence, and, um, you know, these things that, you know, some of the incredible feats of intelligence that crows are capable of, like, if you've ever seen any of those videos of crows solving puzzles for food, it's fucking, right. like, what? they're able to, like, pick yeah. up toothpicks that they have to, like, you know, stick this toothpick in this hole and then stick this tool mm-hmm. over here and then go over there and pull this lever and it opens, like, like crows are able to figure this out. So now, there, so there's either yeah. one of two things happening with plant intelligence and crows solving puzzles it's it's either they have 
way more intelligence than they should for the type of brain they have and the amount of neurons they have, or they're tapped into something more basic. And I mm-hmm. think that I think the latter is probably more likely the fact that there is this sort of more basic natural intelligence that just doesn't hurry, but it finds a way and it's sort of coursing through everything. But because we have such high speed, high horsepower wetware, we're kind of mm-hmm. we're, we're kind of shut off to whatever that that is. Right. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. It's like uh, it, we have lost balance in a sense with. Uh, using the tools that are at our disposal and we've overworked one muscle and uh, you know others are sort of atrophied as a result although it seems that uh, there is uh, some level of balancing perhaps that's happening in society now with more, you know less and less ridicule for these kinds of concepts than maybe there was a month ago 10 years ago you know it's just like people are seem to be opening more and more and more as science and you know science and spirituality seem to be doing a dance that really mirror a lot you know the the, the hardcore science is mirroring a lot of the ideas when you look at like the double slit experiment and mm-hmm. things like that and mm-hmm. how you know these these particles are in a state of quantum superposition when consciousness is present it sort of snaps into one location this is very much in line with a lot of things that you know, sort of the the spiritual minded people are talking about that the observer is creating reality and, you know, where attention goes, it sort of creates, you know, this whole law of attraction thing. So, yeah, yeah. And, and on the the whole idea of the sort of a lot of the riddles central to a lot of weird quantum behavior, there's something I heard a few months ago, where there was a new paper published about the idea of, you know, the one of the ways to solve some of these strange behaviors that we've been talking about, you know, like the measurement problem where, uh, you know, you know, there are two particles in superposition and you measure one in the waveform that connects the two collapses. Mm -hmm. What, one of the ways that they, um, propose to explain this is by saying, well, if you just assume that the past condition of the particle is impacted by the future, then that's, then it's no problem. And then you're like, hold on. Mainstream uh, academia is trying to say that right. that the future state of the particle travels back in time to mm. create these conditions, and and I thought this was just going to be kind of a one off weird, you know, academic mm. theoretical paper, and I just I just pulled this up because I I saw this article the other day, and mind you, this is physics.org okay publishing this this yeah, is not right. this is not a a a publication that like cherry picks wooey stuff and this is the the article right. the article or the uh quote that i chopped out of it that is essentially summing this whole thing up when an experimenter chooses the measurement setting with which to measure a particle that decision can influence the properties of that particle in the past even before the experimenter made their choice in other words, right. a decision made in the present can influence something in the past. What the yeah. fuck? <laughs> well, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that is, uh, that's what I, I just absolutely love. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many people that really want to look at things from a scientific perspective. And that's why I made that comment. It's like, you know, it's, they're doing such a dance now where uh, you go down the rabbit hole of, of physics and it's like, it's weirder than any of the woo-woo stuff that uh, I might be prone to talk about all the time. It's like, it's just as bizarre. So it's really, and the more we understand it, the more, you know, you're seeing papers like this that are coming out on physics.org and you're thinking, what, what world am I living in again? Where's the world from 10 years ago, you know, or 20 years ago? So it, things are changing so quickly. It's, it's fascinating. It is. It is. And, and you were kind of alluding to, you know, this, this merging of, of spirituality and science. And, and I certainly want to believe that, or I, or I at least want to, I don't know, I, to, to a certain degree, I start to hate terminology and words and semantics because, sure you know all they these get things such charge yeah, it's just yeah. like the the, like word, the word god <laughs> god or drug or spirituality it's just like oh we're gonna have to do a lot of nuanced uh-huh. groundwork here before i even talk to anybody else but i mean uh, people right. like people like you and me are kind of always alluding to these ideas that there is this you know again here's a phrase i hate raising of consciousness because what the fuck does yeah. that mean and on, like, so, so so my point is is like on one hand i love it um, and I remember, you know, back in 2012, when this was just like palpable, like just seeking this 
stuff out and wondering if December 21st was going to be some sort of huge, <laughs> like, turning The point. aliens were coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <sighs> but now it's sort of graduated to this this platitude, right? The raising of consciousness. Like people are, are like building, you know, conscious media organizations around this idea. And I'm aware that I'm lumped in with that to a large extent. And on one hand, I celebrate it. And on the other hand, I really want people to understand what I mean when I say that I'm not talking about some bullshit because I don't care about anything that's not going to have a direct impact on my own life or a direct positive impact on the life of other people. So I guess it's a roundabout way of asking when you do hear that, that sort of uh, vernacular raising of consciousness, what does that, what does that mean to mm-hmm. you? You know, uh, I totally get it and respect and understand 100% people who are, um, sort of, um, very sensitive to a lot of these things. Like you're very intelligent, very bright, very sharp guy. And it's like, Oh, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be that woo woo person who's way over the edge and just, you know, uh, ridiculous. I get it. Uh, however, for me, it's, I guess I'm, I've seen so much that supports a lot of these ideas, I'm a little less sensitive to that. It's like, okay, call me what, say whatever you want, you know, call me what you will. Like I, you know, I'm more loose about it all. Right. And at the same time, by doing so, what is the result? Like you said, how how does it impact people? Well, by being this way for me, being a little, little less guarded than you are, Mm -hmm. let's say, um, it's, uh, well, the impact is I've been able to have a, like a lot of impact on people. So it's, it's worked, you know, for the people around me or even people, you know, tuning into my show and getting those messages. Oh my gosh, you know, I was suicidal a couple of months yeah, ago and now yeah. my world is turning around. So it's like, okay, this is really serving me well and, and working well. At the same time, I, I am, you know, I always say we teach best what we most need to learn. <laughs> the more we know, we realize we don't know. I love the all the science and all that stuff and want to dig in. And that's why I have people like Dean Radin on the show as well. And um, so I, I try and walk a real fine line. I think we have to be careful uh, a lot of times not to push too hard against it, right? Right, right. Uh, like, oh, that these people are kind of kooky and I don't want to be kooky. So I'm going to say that raising the consciousness like is sort of a – a, a negative idea or there's too much charge there. Um, for me, like that's, it's, it's a pretty simple definition. It's like when you, uh, I, I instead of raising conscious consciousness, I almost like expanding consciousness mm-hmm, more. It's mm-hmm. like seeing more, right? Yes, so yes. most people are looking like this and if you've got these blinders on and all of a sudden they each go one foot out on e- either side of your, your right and left eye, you're expanded what you can see. You're seeing more of the picture of the puzzle. Will we ever see the whole puzzle? I seriously doubt it in our physical forms, you know? So it's uh, raising consciousness, expanding consciousness. They're just, you know, words are always like these sort of um, feeble attempts to describe things. Uh, But at the same time, like that particular, um, you know, idea, like I talk a lot about with with my show, it's like uh, helping you to raise your vibration five days a week. Well, for some people that is uh, annoying or what does that mean to like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, you know, yeah, it's what, like, what, does it, what does it what, mean? What does it mean? Yeah. What does it mean? Okay. So if I'm sitting here and I'm talking about, you know, uh, let's say a horror movie or mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. dark, right? Yeah. Where am I, where am I vibrating? What, you know, for me, everything we, we do know, scientifically speaking, everything is vibration, right? The particles that make me up, the particles that make you up, uh, they're, they're these vibrations of energy that aren't solid at all. They're 99.9999% space. Mm-hmm. We don't know where they come from or where they go to. They're popping in and out of existence so quick, a flicker so fast, it appears solid. That's all illusory. We know that from a scientific standpoint. So it's, it's all vibration. We, we know everything is vibration. So is that woo woo or is that really what's going on? Well, yeah. to me, that's really what's going on. So if I'm talking about something really dark and let's talk, let's have a conversation about serial killers and this awful right, thing that happened, right. what's happening to my vibration? What I feel it's a pretty safe thing to say it's, it's being lowered. And also if there is any truth to the idea of, you know, where attention goes, energy flows, the sort of law of attraction idea, which, you know, once again, there's another very charged <laughs> topic, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To me, it's, 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 
a very neutral idea, the law of attraction. It's like the law of gravity. I don't need to understand it whatsoever to walk off a cliff, whether I'm a good person, a bad person, whatever, I'm going to feel the effects of the law of gravity, right? Same thing with law of attraction. If there is this law that, which I believe that, uh, you know, like attracts like, so if I'm vibrating with a certain frequency, mm-hmm. I'm going to attract more of it into my world. So what does raising vibration means? Well, when we talk about topics like we're talking about right now, it doesn't take you know a genius to decipher. They don't even have to physically see me. You and I are seeing each other on video right now. I get very excited. My vibration is elevated. I feel like I'm plugged into a, a, a light socket, if you yeah, will, yeah. whenever I get on these topics. So I feel good. At, you know, Everything feels to be vibrating at a higher level than if I'm dwelling in you know eating twinkies and contemplating um you know serial killers <laughs> yeah yeah and and i love what you just said about um you feel like you're plugged into a light socket when you have these conversations because i feel the same way man i feel the exact same way and the fact that you are creating a space for people to commune around these ideas and these curiosities that are central to the human condition is exactly why i'm doing what i'm doing because i have always been pulled toward trying to have these conversations, but 99 people out of 100 that you meet at a party do not mm-hmm. want to sit down and talk about quantum physics, you know? But, however, right. 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 as soon as you start like putting it out in into the, the technosphere, into the universe, it starts to attract this tribe of curious people. And there's a lot mm-hmm. of people out there because, and this is one of my go-to rants, but we do not have the space curated for these types of this type of thinking there is no mystery school there is no platonic school of philosophy to go to so we we have to now engineer and curate and create these spaces and have these conversations and play with these ideas and do this exploration or there's just this void and i think that's what that's exactly what you're seeing with podcasting and and it doesn't to an extent it doesn't even matter if it's a sports podcast or a podcast about, you know, uh, topics more like what you and I talk about. It, it's all people. I mean, just think about the power of creating a space for information like that. Yeah. That didn't used to exist. I mean, you used to, used to like, take your hand and do this on a piece of paper, you know, like over and over again to, to even approximate what, what we're doing now. And then you had to do it by hand in another book in another book in another book you know i mean just that's that's extraordinarily powerful and magical it really is for me it's been you know i launched the positive head podcast by um, two years ago and i'm almost at 500 episodes that's why and yeah, I do five a week. And you know, that's sort of the, the whole premise is helping you to elevate your vibration five days a week. And so it's been uh, what you just said is so such an accurate, interesting thing to contemplate, because actually, I've always been a writer, but I have a love hate relationship with writing. It's like, you know, I'm slow at it because I'm such a perfectionist. So by the time I'm done with something, it is really impactful and good. And I'm really good at it. Right. But it took me like to take the content that I've laid down over the last, you know, two years, just turning on a mic five days a week and kind of with 10 minutes of preparation and seeing what comes out. Um, I would have taken me lifetime. So it really is such a powerful, there's this, you know, to me, there definitely appears to be this sort of quickening happening where, you know, the, the internet is the wiring of, you know, sort of the nervous system of the planet. Now we can, you and I have the ability to, you know, think about even before the printing press, so they were to write something down, then what, what did they made copies like physical manual copies or before the written word, like then what, you know? So it just seems to be getting more and more, you know, maybe, you know, 30 years from now, there will be no podcast. It's like, I just download the information right to your brain. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's uh, it is, it is a wild time to be alive and to see how information can travel so quickly and that we can have the opportunity to create these spaces. It's like, it's the wild west. I'm, I just had, um, 
Kevin Kelly from, uh, I don't know if you know, Kevin Kelly oh, is wow. the, yeah, one of the yeah, founders yeah. of Wired. That's yeah, amazing. Wired cool. on. Uh, yeah, he was amazing. I, I was really excited to get him on. And uh, actually, that, that episode's coming out in another, I think next week, actually. And he was saying that the gray beards 30 years from now will look back now as this is the time where there's more opportunity than there has ever been because of all the technology and all the low-hanging fruit that there is just everywhere to create these you know, these, um, um, tools, he even, you know, he was talking about, he's like, look, the thing, the, 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 the tool that's the most used 20 years from now, you know, AI related, perhaps it doesn't even exist yet. Like it hasn't been thought. So it's still out there. You can still be the person that brings it. He's, you know, he, he, he really was emphasizing for anyone to be a, you just bring awareness to how much opportunity there is mm-hmm. and whatever you and I are called to this kind of work. We love to, to talk and ponder, you know, these mysteries, the greater mysteries and all these things. And, um, but there's so many opportunities on all levels as the planet sort of uh, wires itself yeah. together more and yeah. more. And, and yeah. And, and it's, it's really interesting because again, it's, it's the, the future is, is neither nor. I'm extremely optimistic about the future. I think the future is headed in a very exciting direction overall, because what I'm seeing Mm -hmm. happening is I'm seeing humanity being put into a funnel in that so much is going to be automated that the humans are finally going to be forced to just be fucking humans and be creative and and do what only humans can do. Because if you're not doing something only a human can do, a robot's going to do it pretty soon. And to me, that's on one hand. Yeah. If I was, um, a, somebody in control of the government or the economy, I would be terrified because I would think, Oh, we're going to lose 50% of jobs in the next 40 years. But Mm -hmm. me as a human being, I'm like, thank God jobs are the worst shit that's (laughs) ever happened to me. You know, but I know we've got this idea that they've got to be like, that's what we're here to do because this system has taught us when what you just touched on is really what I believe it's about. We're, I believe we are, uh, creators. We, we are, that's, we're one with personally, I believe we're one with the creator, the source that created all of this. So what does it do? It is most, uh, gratified, joyous, happiest when it's creating, which is how I feel, you know, for us, we're, we're lit up when we're doing this, we're being creative in this way, in a way that really, you know, works for us and resonates with our, our being. So, yeah, I mean, it's a trip though. I was just talking to my friend who owns a Tesla and uh, we went to, this uh, little festival five points gathering up in Mount, Mount Baldy uh, just outside of LA last weekend. And I met him there and he's like, yeah, man, this, you know, I just got here. He's like, it was so cool. I just had it on autopilot the whole time. You know, I didn't hardly, I didn't do anything coming from LA to Mount Baldy an hour and a half. And he was talking about it and he was like, he was telling me that now the autopilot, um, that, that, you know, Tesla is utilizing five times safer than humans driving. And I'm like, wow, he's like already, he's like, you know, it'll probably be until it's a million fold till we make it illegal for anyone to drive, but it's already five X, you know, yeah. you driving versus it driving. Like what a trip. Yeah. Huh? Not hard to make a philosophical argument that you're actually putting people in harm's way by not having autopilot. It would, it would be great if it became the law, like your car, cars just have to have autopilot. I've, I've had the, the yep. chance to, to drive one and ride in one too. And man, it is it is so trippy because you know you're you're zipping along. Like imagine you set your cruise control at fifty, um, and and the, for people listening that haven't had the, and, and soon this is going to be just normal, which is incredible. But oh, you know great. it's like you you set the top end of the cruise control, like let's say eighty, but it will just adapt to whatever's in front of you. And if somebody slams on the brakes in front of you, you don't have to do anything. And and just watching great. someone do that, like riding in a car where that's going on, it's extremely strange. The first couple times but then once but then once you just see the car stop it's like oh wow this like works really well and then and like (laughs) you're saying like you see you see the long term of of, well pretty soon driving's not going to be about looking out the window and having your hands on the wheel it's going to just be about relaxing and going from point a to point b and then well what am i going to do with all that time i don't know maybe i'll get vr in my car you know and you just start thinking about you know we're we're gonna it Something's happening. Something's happening where this division yeah. between people and technology and the distance, you know, from me to you is shrinking. And I don't know what the ultimate expression of that looks like, but I'm personally excited mm. for it. You know, I, I love to sort of um, 
uh, philosophize and, you know, um, for me, just looking at, okay, what does that mean? Yes, everything's coming closer. The distance, the gap is shortening. Uh, VR is going to have us sitting, you know, this same conversation. We'll think back 20 years from now. Man, remember when we used to use this like primitive video screen to talk to each other? And, yeah. you know, now we're sitting in the same room virtually. And so the, the gap is, is shortening. It's, it's, it's closing. And so my, my take, my two cents, what feels true, rings true to me is – we're merging this this dimension the, that we live in, the third dimension, is merging with the next. So it's sort of like, I believe source, we're one with the source that created it all, right? And so as it separates itself into infinite fractals and experiences all the things that come along with separation, it reaches a point where that has played its course to the fullest, and then there becomes a, uh, you know, separation, and then there's a unification. And this is sort of what it does. This is how it God gods, to use a very loaded mm-hmm. word. This is God godding, right? The, and the, um, the Brahma. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what what's happening? We've turned a corner where we're now uh, coming back together. It's all coming back together, and the the gap between self and others is closing. A lot of ideas about it's all one, you know, of course, bubbling up. I go to a lot of these transformational festivals. Uh, and you know, it's a it's a trip to see you know twenty year olds. It's like the cool thing, spirituality. You know, mm-hmm. it's like. Mm-hmm. Wow, that was not the case when, you know, 20 years ago, it was not even considered uh, as something that, you you know, I, I couldn't find anyone to talk about the subject with. It was like reading a book and, you know, I'd talk to people about it and they'd think, okay, that's really interesting or you're crazy, one of the two, and go about their regular lives. Now, all these people are sort of, you know, into these ideas and exploring these ideas and, you know, contemplating these ideas and applying them to their lives in a way that is sort of their whole life is centered around these ideas that, you know, there really are no others, right? Everywhere I go, I'm there waiting for myself. It's always an extension of self telling me it's a feedback loop. It's always telling me something about myself. And as I play with those ideas, you know, I can't help but see amazing results, which helps to reinforce the idea that this is indeed what's going on to kind of circle back even to what we talked about earlier, early on. And so I personally believe it's like this merging is happening, this unification, realizing that we are creators, right? We don't need to, we, the fact that we live on a planet where we have this imaginary paper or now numbers in a computer that, you know, control all the abundance and there's plenty for everyone to live, um, you know, well and, and, and to be fed and have clean water. And we could do all of that. And the fact that we're not doing it is just like, what a, a riot, like uh, not a riot. It's not funny. It's like, it's sad. Yeah, but at the yeah. same time, I believe that's, that is sort of the, part of the game that we we signed up for you know separation experiencing all this negative stuff so that we can experience the unification and it actually means something you know if, if there is eternity and we are source it gets boring and that's where the idea of evil comes from and all these these negative concepts that sort of trip a lot of people up it's it's all ultimately happening for for love for good and in, in my opinion I, I think so too, and I and I see things flowing in that direction, in in the direction of plenty, and I, and I think it's important to remind ourselves that a lot of the shitty things we see in the world are from applications of philosophical ideas that have either run their course or they have holes in them, right? Because culture is really just like a physical manifestation of a philosophical idea, right? Like capitalism mm-hmm. is a philosophical idea, right? Socialism is a philosophical right. idea, et cetera, et cetera. And while there right. are certainly elements of capitalism that's great, and it seems to be one of the paradigms that's best for the most people, that doesn't mean it's the best mm-hmm. ever that there will ever be. You know, like we, we need to figure out a way to harmonize what we have going with human beings more than it does already, because it obviously is leaving a lot of people behind. And I'm not saying that doesn't mean people should not have to try or there should be some sort Mm -hmm. of thing that just props up every single human being. But I mean, you know, it's that that's like a that is a ethical question we have to ask ourselves. Are we cool with just letting a giant portion of the population of the planet either suffer 
or or do shitty work to prop up the people at the top and i think that right. that's going to be interesting going forward because it, you know again all these questions about automation come back and and what we want humanity to be for like you know the 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 uh, thought experiment of, of what happens when you when you take all these jobs away that we were talking about earlier while people are forced to be people and create I don't know I mean I start I start going yeah. down this, this gloomy direction where I'm like well maybe we got too many people <laughs> right 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 well you know and that's why I believe in, in one of the reasons I'm so okay with you know I guess leaning more towards um maybe uh, for lack of a better word, the, some of the woo woo concepts and putting them out there very, you know, without any real concern or regard for someone judging me as crazy mm-hmm. or, you know, not, not legitimate because I feel like it really, that is the message more than anything that needs to be um, received by people. And that is this idea of oneness. Like it, literally it's all an extension of self, Right even just playing with that idea. Like once again, this is why it always rings so true for me because when I apply it, how, what are the results? Well, if I really believe that you're an extension of me and I act accordingly, what happens? I I feel good. You feel, you know, endorphins or if I, if I do an act of kindness, perform Mm -hmm, an act mm -hmm. of kindness, the person performing the act of kindness, endorphins are released. It's this wonderful feeling. The person receiving releases endorphins, these wonderful feelings, even someone witnessing the act of kindness, same exact thing. So we're just spreading joy. We're spreading goodness. So, you know, for me, I'm just aggressively going in the direction of, Hey guys, it's all you. Hey, you know, politicians, don't you realize that like, you're doing it to yourself, right? It's and you will ultimately feel the energetic repercussions at some level, I believe, whether now, whether delayed, whether beyond this life, whether in another life, I, I don't know exactly. But I do believe whatever you put out is coming back because you're always doing it to an extension of self. So for me, that is the most important idea to, for everyone to just be open to you know, you don't have to be as, as uh, over the edge as me and say, this is the way it is. You know, just be open to the idea that literally, you know, just play with the idea in your own life. Anyone yeah, listening yeah. for a day, for a week, that everywhere you go, you're there waiting for yourself. It's all an extension of self. The, the, the like me that you're hearing right now is a part of your consciousness that resonates with this information. The, 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 the person you'll bump into at the grocery store is a complete asshole, right? That's another part of you that's reflecting something, Mm -hmm. you know, back to your complex, multi-layered being. And when you start playing with, okay, these are all parts of self that are telling me something about myself. For me in the past, when I had a little different perspective, and not to say I don't slip into separation mentality from time to time, of course I do, but in the past, it's like I would bump up against someone and they would do something to me and then I would uh, react and show them how I'm right and, you know, it's how do I win this argument and, you know, come out on top. And now I can't go there for more than a second until I, I've trained myself to say, oh, hold on, this they're just a prop in my movie. What are they telling me about me that I need to become more aware of? And when I, since I started playing with that idea, this is happening for me, not to me, right? And it's happening through me, not to me. Um, you know, the self growth that's taken place, the amount of, um, you know, abundance I've been able to call into my life, uh, the amount of happiness, health, all the things, you know, all indicators point to, yes, this is the direction to go, you know? And so for me, just trying to get that idea out to as many people as possible to at least play with Mm -hmm. like, Hey, it's all you, you know, all is literally one act accordingly or experiment with the idea. That's pretty much yeah, my mess. I, I love that sentiment, man. I love that sentiment because it's perspective. It's you're, you're talking about perspective at, at the, the very core of that idea. Right. And, and I mean, even, even if you just took that right to its logical conclusion and, and boiled it down to something like two options, option one is that the universe operates from a model of scarcity and you need to protect mm. and gather and, and, you know, shield and do all of those types of actions that come along with scarcity. Or the universe operates uh, from an altruistic, you know, valve of some sort. It, it operates from a giving valve, a valve of plenty. 
go just mm. just live live one day in in each paradigm mm-hmm. and see which one you like better because totally. one of them exactly. sucks one of them sucks <laughs> and it will make you alone and paranoid and unfulfilled and one will lead to right. all the fulfillment in the world so i i completely agree and and am congruent with you on that man procedural question i gotta ask you this how mm-hmm. do you do a five day a week podcast? Because, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I mean, and I, I get doing it. I mean, it's like, I, I understand what it would be like. The problem, like for, for me, I feel like is it would start to feel like a job. It would start to feel like mm-hmm. I sit down and I get into the whole podcast mentality and it becomes like work. How, how have you mm-hmm. avoided that? How have you like maintained the passion and how have you continued to make it fresh? Because, you know, even for me, like I do one a week and I feel like I'm saying the same shit all the time. How, yep, yep, how yep, do you yep. how do you well, avoid I, these things? It's such a great question. And it's funny because every podcaster asks me the same question pretty much. And, you know, it started out as an experiment. I started out just doing one, doing an interview once a week. Mm-hmm. And I went down that path for maybe six, eight months, something like that. And then what I realized is. I was talking over my guests way too much. I had way too much that I want to get out. And, um, you know, having felt for a very long time that a big part of what my path is and been shown in in ways that are somewhat um, bizarre uh, and psychedelic type of experiences uh, where I've, I've sort of had been reinforced, hey, you're here to help be a bridge to people who are sort of waking up to some of these concepts and, and being a guide, right? And so knowing that and believing that for a long time and then getting to the point where I'm doing interviews and then it's like, okay, this is awesome. I'm getting to talk to a lot of the people that I want to talk to and and about the subjects that I want to talk to, but I'm not fully fulfilling my own need to sort of, you know, my brand of whatever this is, you know, (laughs) uh, putting and transmitting to the, to the, to the universe. Um, so I started with, uh, you know, at first with uh, my friend who edits the show, Dalian, uh, and um, have him as a co-host, and we just started talking. Okay, let's do much shorter episodes, and we'll we'll just you know uh, pick something to talk about, maybe a story that's cool in the news that we like, the science based or whatever, or something somewhat trippy or you know interesting that's happening. Take quote. I, I'm such a nerd for like quotes, and and so let's take a quote, and I'll break that down and give my interpretation of it. Okay, let's maybe play clips of another teacher that I really admire and really resonate with the, the message that they're putting out. Like, uh, you know, um, um, uh, Wayne Dyer or, um, you know, Abraham, or there's so many good teachers out there uh, at Cartol. There's just a ton of them that are putting out amazing content that really helped me. And, and so let's, uh, so it just kind of ended up happening where, okay, let's at first, let's do it five days. And if it's too much, Um, I'll stop. And what I found was as I, as I did it and I was pretty intimidated by it at first is it just, as I got feedback from people and so many people, like if you go and and read, you know, um, any of my reviews, there's a lot of people who it's like, I just found this. I locked into it. I'm just opening up to these ideas. And now because I have this sort of, um, daily sort of, um, transmission to lock into it's like working out right it's like yeah, yeah uh, that's a good soul, soul food for thought so so the more you are putting taking on this vibration the more uh it's sort of getting uh, embedded you're rewiring your your brain of course as well and um so it's sort of you know what really fuels me is the feedback that i get i get so much feedback on how much it's helped people so now i feel like it would be really letting people down if I stopped. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I started something that I can't really, I mean, could I cut it back? And I have, I considered it at at times. Yeah, because, you know, I'm an entrepreneur too. And I have uh, entrepreneurial ventures that are, you know, like I have a company right now that is really growing a lot and, you know, keeps me going. And what's, what's been made it easier than it sounds is I'll get up each day I'll spend a few minutes, I'll have coffee, I'll just kind of, okay, what what's bubbled up for me? What's happened in my world? Or what question did I receive from a listener? Or, you know, what's just something that I've thought about in the last 24 hours that, um, that 
I could talk about. And I always say on the show, hey, guys, I'm repeating myself all the time, just like you said. But I feel like that's necessary. It's like it's just like if you're going to get good at basketball, what are you doing? You're repeating the same shots over and over and over and over again. So we're looking at these same things from slightly different angles. I can say the same thing uh, 10 times. And on the 11th, I the person receiving it is different. I'm slightly different. I maybe just said it from a slightly different angle where it uh, resonates in such a way that it really causes uh, a big, you know, um, turn, you know, turning point for that person. So, um, so yeah, I, I definitely, uh, feel you and you, it's like, how do you not, you know, get redundant? I, I, I actually own the redundancy. I'm like <laughs> claiming this is going to be redundant guys. Like you're going to hear me talk about this again and again and again and again, and that's uh, necessary. So that's a long answer to your question, but I'll get up each day and then I'll, I'll prepare for not very long, maybe 15 minutes or so if I have a question or maybe there's a clip that I found that I really like and that makes it easy. My, they're only 30 minutes and I've got a 10 minute clip and I do an intro, I read a review, you know, I play a song at the end. So they're not nearly as long of a conversation as we've already had here mm-hmm, too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that definitely helps. And, and I think what you said about repetition is actually very powerful and the connection between working out repetition mm-hmm. and then also taking it a step further and, and thinking of it like a mantra, right? Because we mm-hmm. have re- like received so much programming throughout our life, social programming, philosophical programming, like just by osmosis, just think, think about how powerful the idea of school is from, you know, when the bell rings, I stand up and do this. When the teacher says this, I raise my hand and do this. Yep, and and yep. all, all of these things that there comes a point where you gain your con- control over yourself to a certain degree. And once you have that control, you're allowed to program yourself with whatever kind of thoughts you want. And it requires it to be some sort of mantra like practice because they, they didn't give it a break when we were ages one through 18, Mm -hmm, you know, like, (laughs) so so now we need to, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So now, so now we're charged with what kind of world do we want to live in? What do we want to believe in? And, and to, to an extent that requires repetition. So, so I'm, I'm totally down with, with what you're saying, man. I'm totally down with what you're saying. Um, I guess we are um, past an hour. So do you want to tell people where Positive Head lives? Uh, where does it live? Um, yeah. Well, it definitely lives in my head. <laughs> <laughs> maybe in the ether, maybe beyond the beyond. I don't know. Um, no, you can, of course, find um, the Positive Head podcast uh, really anywhere that, you know, podcasting lives. Uh, you know, of course, iTunes and SoundCloud and PositiveHead.com is my website. And, um, you know, Google Play, all the places, all the, the podcast apps. Um, and, Yeah. It's uh, like I said, it's, it's such a labor of love and to be making a difference for me, you know, I've had success in business and, you know, uh, have done some pretty cool things, success in health and relationships at times. Uh, maybe that's back and forth. That's maybe more Rocky, but, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of just a very good life and so many good things that have happened and there's been nothing, you know, that's been more rewarding than, getting that feedback from someone where it's making a difference in their world. And ultimately they're doing, they're making the conscious choice themselves. There's so many things to tune into out there and the people that are tuning in. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm doing it five days a week and just sort of seeing what comes up freestyling, you know, the daily episodes. And it's incredible too, when you play with the universe in that way, the amount of synchronicity that arises and, you know, it's just like a nonstop, um, and it becomes a game. It becomes just fun, you know? So it, it, it has its moments where it seems like a job, but more than anything, it's like, I, I, I love it so much. It's it rarely feels like that. And, you know, even five episodes a week, I'm because I'm freestyling four of them. It's like, you know, how much time am I really putting into it? Not, not that much. So, mm-hmm. well, fantastic, man. Thanks so much for, for, uh, coming by to third eye drops. This has been beautiful. So glad to have another, uh, brother in the, in the whole paradigm of whatever this, I don't even know what to call it. I'm afraid afraid to call it something for all the reasons that I hate words, but, um, but yeah, whatever it is. So glad you're there, man. So glad. Yeah. Likewise. It is, it is truly, um, 
an honor to connect with you and, and see what you're doing. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, I think we were recording, you know, being new to the MindPod network as well and uh, seeing uh, coming together. If anything that I'm, I'm as a fault, maybe at times is being somewhat of an island, being separating myself, just kind of like so fiercely independent. I don't like pay attention to too much of what other people are doing or, you know, listen to that many other podcasts, not because I'm not interested, because just I'm doing so many mm-hmm. things. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, it takes tuning in, not trans and I'm maybe overly obsessed with transmitting and I should be receiving more. But um, so now connecting with you and, you know, all the other folks on my podcast network it's truly such a such an honor and such a beautiful reflection and i mean even so much so when we first turned on the skype i'm like i, I we had we've laughed because literally you have the same color background <laughs> your hair is almost the same of mine when it's not wet i'm like hold on am i seeing him or am i is that me <laughs> just maybe a little better looking now <laughs> but um yeah man it's a pleasure it really is a pleasure and uh, you're you're a beautiful reflection and it's an honor to ha- be on your show and i look forward to having you on positive head yeah likewise which is going to happen likewise in yeah yeah i'm excited i'm excited for it i'm going to whisper this outro because i'm pretty sure saul heard me say that i was going to downgrade him before and is looking for an opportunity to take advantage of me. Maybe I'm being paranoid, but you heard what he said, right? Anyway, uh, positivehead.com is where you can check out Brandon's media vessel, Positive Head. If you want to support Third Eye Drops, please consider crowd sponsoring us at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops check out third eye drops.com and or commune with us on facebook on the facebook page the facebook group whatever tickles your curiosity pickle all right my friends we will be back next week with another mind meld if i survive that long if I don't, please avenge me. Oh shit, I think he's scanning the room now. Michael, let's play. Transmission complete. Shall we continue?